Hello, everyone. This is John Shaw, the director of the Paul Simon Public Policy Institute, Southern Illinois University in Carbondale. Thanks for joining another installment of our series, Understanding Our New World. And today we're delighted to be, to be joined by really an amazing writer um, and a really gifted storyteller, uh, Tom Zollner. Tom is the uh, politics editor of the Los Angeles Review of Books. Tom's had a great career. He's actually from Arizona, fifth generation. Um, he's had a, a, a really remarkable career in journalism, worked for such uh, papers as, and I love this one, the Wyoming Tribune and Eagle, uh, the Arizona Republic, San Francisco Chronicle, has written for uh, the, the Atlantic, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Foreign Policy, and Harper's. He's the author or co-author of eight books, won the National Book Critics Award. And I love just the range of books that he's written about. Um, he's written a book on Gabby Giffords, the shooting, and how it connects to the sort of modern Arizona. Um, has written a book about the revolt, the Jamaican revolt that ended slavery in the British Empire, the global diamonds trade, uranium, trains, and the man who inspired the film Hotel Rwanda. Uh, in addition to working for the Los Angeles Review of Books, he teaches writing at Chapman University and also Dartmouth College. And we're going to spend a lot of time today talking about his terrific book, The National Road. This is just an amazingly funny, interesting, and really profound book. And I really look forward to digging into it with Tom. So, Tom, good to see you, my friend. Good to be here. And thank you for that generous introduction. Well, let's talk about journalism, because that was your initial pull. Uh, uh, you know, and you talk about your first job, I think it was with the Appleton uh, newspaper, maybe it was a college internship or something, the, the Appleton Post Crescent. And you write, you said, I knew for certain what I wanted to do for the next 50 years. I wanted to pour a trickle of words onto the flimsy pages of new, newsprint and help cover America. It seemed like the best job ever created. We'll talk in a little bit about the, the, the newspaper industry, but talk about the initial uh, attraction to journalism for you. Oh, sure. I mean, there's something absolutely magical about um, the documentation of the life of a city um, that's, uh, that's instantaneous, that uh, provides a, a common point of reference uh, for all the citizens, um, that, 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 that allows you to um, go in and uh, tell the truth. Uh, about what's happening. Um, governments and businesses are so eager to sort of put out a certain story about themselves, and it's really up to um, the, 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 the town's newspaper to instill a sense of honesty. Um, not always uh, done very well, not always done very effectively. And, you know, uh, a, a great quality for uh, a local journalist in, in, in the United States or any country really is to sort of feel almost personally offended if, if you're lied to that, you know, it's your job to uh, not pass that on and, and, and put it in the pages of the local daily and make it for many people reality. So there was a, there was an integrity about it. And uh, as you well know, John, I mean, it's just such a embattered profession, uh, not just uh, economically, uh, but intellectually, uh, the idea that uh, this is all fiction, um, uh, used as a partisan whipping boy. Uh, it's, it's been, a, a, in many ways, a terrible time, but in other ways, it's been a tremendously exciting time. And you said that yourself, you describe yourself as kind of a naturally shy person. So this not only gives you a license, but sort of a, a mandate to go up to strangers and ask questions and, and be inquisitive. Yeah, I mean, I, I think all of us sort of have that curiosity about um, other people, um, where, where, where do they go at night? And, you know, what are they really thinking? And what, what, what drives this person? I mean, you're not necessarily going to get answers to those deep spiritual questions in the pages of, uh, let's just say the pure and journal star that we were just talking about. Right. But it, it, it does provide opportunities to open that gap, uh, to close the gap rather with uh, a potentially interesting stranger. And, they tell you things and to get spiritual about it, they, they kind of bless you when they uh, talk about their experiences. Well, let's talk just for a sec about you uh, a year in New York City when you were trying to write the great American novel and and uh, you, you write a powerful essay in this book about um, about that year, the difficulty, the loneliness, you know, trying to survive financially, and also just kind of discovering that fiction really was not your best mode of expression. Talk about that a little bit. 
Sure. Um, I have tremendous admiration for novelists um, who uh, have the ability to create a convincing world and to uh, inhabit uh, people that never lived and make them walk around and, and, and say intriguing things and come up with these, you know, unexpected um, uh, either statements or plot twists or whatever it may be. Uh, I think it's a, it's a special talent and um, I <laughs> It took a long time to figure out that I don't have it. <laughs> well, I have to ask you about just the range of nonfiction books you've written. I mean, I, I touched on them, and it just seems it's worth it. I mean, how do, how do ideas like that hit you? I mean, I, I'm thinking of the Gabby Gifford shooting. I mean, obviously, you know, that was an event that triggered a kind of a broader reflection. But, you know, uranium, the diamonds industry, the tra trains, I mean, what, what, what sparks, uh, you know, at what point does just kind of a, a, a sort of passing interest coalesce into a, a book project? Yeah. Um, when students, uh, either undergraduate or graduate, you know, ask me about is such and such a book, you know, um, and it may well be, I, I find it helpful to ask three sort of uh prosecutorial questions um, before you really get going on, on what may or may not be a, a nonfiction book. The first question is, you know, is this really a magazine article? Um, I think we've all, you know, had the experience of sitting down with a book and realizing, yeah, this, this could have been one tenth as long and, 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 you know, perhaps provided more utility and more accessibility were it just an article and there's nothing, you know, dishonorable about a perfectly good article and, and, and saving everyone's time by not making it a book. Um, a, a second question to ask is, you know, are you going to feel comfortable marinating in this subject for a year and a half? Um, you're going to be with it eight hours a day. You're going to start dreaming about it. You're probably going to get thoroughly sick of it and you're going to have to power through those times. And so like, are you really connected to the subject? Does it obsess you? You know, are, are you not going to be able to let it go? And then um, thirdly, and again, sort of entering kind of a spiritual question here. Does the universe need the book? Is, is there a real calling, a hunger uh, for this book? Not necessarily like a market, which is a question, of course, that, you know, publishers and agents are going to want to know. It's a reasonable question in a, in a capitalist environment. But, you know, does, does the universe need the book? Um, are you saying something that hasn't said, been said before or that needs to be said again in different ways? Um, there are plenty of books and we've all had our time reading them that the universe probably didn't need that book. <laughs> and uh, I've certainly gone down the road of planning a project and coming to the conclusion that the universe really doesn't need this book. Uh, interesting. Well, the universe does need your book, The National Road. <laughs> and, uh, and I want to just talk, I mean, sort of the genre, which is, you know, travel, travel books about the United States. And there have been, you know, a number of them. Um, but you, uh, you sort of hail as a model, a, a book written by John Gunther called Inside USA. And you describe it as a staggering achievement and the best tome about this nation ever written. American identity has never been summarized in a single volume, but this one came close. Talk about this book. John Gunther was a reporter for the Chicago Daily News, now defunct, um, who was assigned to cover Europe um, as a young man in the late 20s, uh, 1930s, and watched a tremendously tumultuous time uh, unfold in many nations on that continent. And he had a, a wonderful, uh, clear-eyed sense of prose and also uh, an encyclopedic uh, approach to the subject, like uh, really, as the academics say, thick description of interwar Belgium, for instance. And you know, you think, oh, it's gonna make my eyes glaze over. Uh, no, I mean, it was, it was just real plain spoken Midwestern prose um, about a, a tremendously complicated situation. And then, um, he found a second career writing books called the Inside Series, that is to say, Inside Europe, uh, Inside Australia, Inside Asia, Inside Africa. And the one on the table here is Inside USA, uh, which uh, I came across this book at, when I was 16 years old and was just blown away. Um, it, it's from this wonderful school of uh, mid-century uh, nonfiction prose. 
that um, was unflashy, um, but tremendously uh, revelatory in uh, what it said. It's just the, the, the exuberance of the totality of the United States. Um, you know, my book asks, aspires to do only one one hundredth of what Gunther did, but um, it, it's I viewed it, I suppose, as an inventory. Well, and Gunther uh, said that the United States was the greatest, craziest, most dangerous, least stable, most spectacular, least grown up, and most powerful and, and magnificent country ever known. Yeah, and when he was writing, and um, I think that line was uh, penned and or published in 1948, um, that was true. Um, we're in a, I think I'm safe on, on safe ground by saying, you know, we're on a different territory here uh, insofar as um, the nature of our lack of stability, um, the, 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 the sense of our national unity. Um, it's, it's been frayed, and this has been explained by, you know, many, many people as to the roots of our um, current uh, malaise. And I can't help but wonder what Gunther would have made out of it. And you say when Gunther would come into a community, he would ask two central questions. One, what makes this community special? And two, who runs this place? Yeah, excellent questions both. I mean, the second one sort of has that odor of um, political bosses, right? That uh, there was single party dominance of uh, city hall machines across the country. I think that's less so today or it takes different forms you know in Gunther's time you had uh, uh, people like uh, the famous boss crump in uh, Memphis Tennessee uh, you had Frank Haig in um, Jersey City um, Chicago famously was a was a, a one-party town with uh, trickle-down patronage which wasn't all that bad wasn't all that great you know but um, there's a certain uh, certain sense of order when it comes to that kind of uh, a political environment. Let's talk about your love of the road. And I want to read a couple sentences to set the context. You say, I have crossed and recrossed the breadth of the United States alone, more or less coast to coast, at least 30 times in the course of 20 years. And I have made hundreds of lesser partial crossings across all 48 contiguous lower states in the bargain, feeling some unspecified hunger to lay down a coat of invisible paint. Um, talk about, and you would tell the story about, uh, oftentimes you're driving by yourself. You talk one time where you, in the course of 28 hours, drove almost 1800 miles with just a couple brief stops. Talk about this kind of hunger to be on the road. For me, it's a deeply patriotic gesture um, to, um, first of all, take a long distance drive. Second of all, to um, do it on um, either US state or county highways to uh, stop along the way and uh, engage whoever you know wants to be engaged. Um, listen to partisan radio that's not of your particular affiliation. Um, uh, savor. Um, what, what's out there, what it, what it wants to be, um, some of the ruins of what it failed to be, um, the sense of uh, all this, uh, you know, roiling human drama uh, going on that, you know, you'll, you'll just only have the briefest glimpse of. There's something just so uh, magical about that. Like, uh, for instance, drive past a, uh, you know, a chain drugstore, a Walgreens, let's call it in New Concord, Ohio. I'm just pulling a town at random. And, you know, inside that Walgreens, who just who works there, there's going to be, you know, 14 to 25 people with all kinds of power relations between them, uh, perhaps some romantic relations. Um, some people might have rivalries with one another. Some people, you know, may, probably knew each other since grade school. Um, it's, it's this like unique sociology and you're zipping past it in four seconds. You know, most patches of ground in the United States or well, really anywhere, but let's just talk about the US are going to be like that. Um, one, th one thing that I used to really like to do, you know, before the pandemic came and I stopped traveling 
um, was to, uh, whenever in a local diner, you know, of course, buy the local paper, always read the local paper and flip to the obituary column and, you know, see who's just, you know, uh, gone to their reward and, 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 and read the, 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 the details and, you know, understand like, you know, you, you kind of missed them by a few days, You'll, you won't meet them here. Um, but it's a window into the uh, really complex, really interesting lives that uh, people lead and are leading right now as we speak all around us. Yeah. And you're also a sucker for historical monuments. You say that uh, you like them in about three short paragraphs that sort of tell you exactly what you're, you know, happened at this place. And as I remember, you said the best ones are in Kansas and the worst in Pennsylvania. Yep. Talk about that. Yeah. Pennsylvania has these little, um, they're colored blue, um, kind of like they are in London, you know, the famous blue plaques. Pennsylvania has these sort of square things. Um, that have room for about 17 words. <laughs> They're just, you know, uh, little telegraphs almost, telegrams, I should say, um, that don't really get into the incident. You know, Kansas will go on for, for three paragraphs. Um, one in Illinois that I really like to visit, um, it's, uh, it's in Alton, Illinois. Uh, town, as everyone knows, on the Mississippi River, uh, just a bit north, north and to the east of St. Louis. And uh, there you find the uh, statue of Elijah Lovejoy, a uh, abolitionist printer who's, uh, who was martyred in the days uh, immediately prior to the Civil War. And um, Alton happens to uh, occupy just a really gorgeous part of, uh, of the Mississippi with, with cliffs. You know, it's almost like the Rhine River in Germany. Um, I know I'm speaking to an Indonesian audience, and this 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 may be part of the the the, the wallpaper for for Southern Illinois. But uh, oh my gosh, I just I just fall in love with that landscape. Right. Well, one thing that you don't like so much, Tom, are interstate highways. And I want to read a couple of sentences and have you reflect. You said, "I think interstate highways are a historic crime against the country, albeit one with grudging benefits." something on the level of life insurance or five dollar movie popcorn or the mexican-american war of 1847 you loathe what they stand for but occasionally appreciate them yeah uh, charles corral uh once said it's uh possible he was writing in the 70s um to now cross the country without seeing anything at all and um yeah uh, they they are uh, efficient. Um, they get you where you're going. They're bland. Uh, we were talking off camera about the, the green tunnel of uh, the Appalachian Trail, you know, the, the, the sort of unrelenting trees that just kind of, you don't manage to really sort of see where you are. Um, interstate highways are like that, are kind of a funnel. Um, I take them. I probably took one yesterday on the way down to work. Um, Nevertheless, uh, you know, uh, there's nothing, there's very little in them to elevate the soul. Well, let's talk about one of the chapters that was really powerful called uh, the title of the book, The National Road. And uh, The National Road, of course, was created by Jefferson in 1806. Um, and it ran, and I think initially from Cumberland, Maryland to actually Vandalia, Illinois. But uh, so you spent some time poking around the National Road. And one thing you found were a lot of Dollar General stores. And you, you, you write this, you said, there are now more Dollar Generals in the United States than there are McDonald's. The Dollar General method is a curious inverse of the Ray Kroc method, seeking not growth, but decline. Let's talk a little bit about Dollar General and just kind of the cultural and economic context, because they are um, important kind of cultural symbols in the United States. And, you know, and not disparaging them, they, they offer products at a, a, a reasonable price but they have a pernicious effect in some ways on the local economy. So talk about, uh, first of all, how you became compelled by uh, Dollar Generals and also in kind of a broader sense of what they represent in the country and its our, our current economy. Sure, I mean, it's a new iteration of the, of the famous uh, big box stars, which, you know, came into uh, rural America starting in the, in the, in the late 60s. Um, a, a Walmart, let's, let's just sort of use the most paradigmatic example. I mean, it's a big, blunt, expensive instrument. 
that um, takes up a huge land footprint, um, requires um, hundreds of employees, um, costs uh, several million dollars to build one of them. Uh, a Dollar General, by contrast, is extremely flexible. You know, it's like a suitcase nuke. Um, you, you need, you know, um, really just four or five employees, period, to run the whole thing. And they all, the employees in there are incredibly harried. They perform different roles. Um, some of them can be built for as little as a quarter of a million dollars once the land has been secured. Um, they're politically popular. A lot of rural places who, you know, are hungry for new business will uh, throw, just look the other way on every zoning, you know, regulation and provide all kinds of easements uh, for these, for these units. And, you know, John, you're right. Like, this is a mixed bag. Like, I'm not going to sit here and call it Dollar General, you know, like the evil empire. Um, they do provide employment. They do provide low cost goods for, um, you know, people who really, you know, need that and don't, you know, the driving 20 to 30 miles to the, the nearest Kroger is just not an attractive option. So it is a profoundly mixed bag because you're also right that, yeah, this tends to uh, decay small businesses, put uh, rural groceries out of business, uh, creates a bland, you know, monoculture look to uh, to a, to a place. Um, there's nothing, uh, and you recall this from your time as a, as a journalist, there's nothing that gets people more exercised in local politics than um, a land use issue. And the unhappiness over Dollar General is very easy to find, you know, um, this, this plays out in uh, county commission meetings all over the place whenever Dollar General comes in. Right. Right. Tom, let's talk, we alluded earlier about the power of newspapers in American communities. And if you, have a, you have a chapter called The Late City Final, which talks about really the dramatic contraction of the newspaper industry, the, the closure of papers, the dramatic scaling back of, of the papers that continue to exist. And you write, but what is lost is a sense of place that a local paper can provide. They were always at their best when the reflect. They were always at their best when the reflected sense of their own geography. When a reader would put it down, feeling like she learned something about the place she lived, though she already knew. Mm -hmm. Talk about the power of local newspapers and, and their importance in American life. Sure, I mean the one of the aphorisms surrounding. Um, the value of a community newspaper is it's a town in conversation with itself. You know, it's, it, it's, a, it's a forum for um, talking through things, through letters to the editor, um, through something um, being covered that would ordinarily just sort of exist on the, on the level of rumor. Um, you know, the, the, the sort of fights that we were just talking about um, regarding Dollar General. I mean, those play out in the pages of the local daily. And, you know, if you're, if you're a citizen wanting to know what, what the heck's going on, you know, down, down that highway, what's the construction crew all about, you know, um, either you're going to, you know, go down to the county courthouse and pull the paperwork yourself, which, you know, very few people are going to do that. You're going to ask around and get rumors or, you know, you're going to pick up the, you know, the, the new sun and uh, read about it and read a, you know, a short digestible um, account of it that's going to be dispassionate, that's going to tell you, well, some say this, some say that, um, here are the facts, you know, done well. Um, a, a newspaper is um, as vital to the health of a community as a level one hospital, um, that they've, you know, disappeared or shrunken down into ghost products in so many places. And that partisan cable news has uh, filled that information gap. You know, I'm, I'm convinced that's part of the reason why um, we have such nasty politics. Um, uh, many people who are far smarter and more attuned to this than I have, have talked about the nationalization of local politics, the way that um, the, the, these kind of titanic superhero questions about liberty and freedom, often very distorted, you know, get mapped onto 
local matters when there's just, you know, there's not really like a, a sort of a Trumpist angle on it, but yet that's how we're being conditioned to think. Tom, you might be amused or, or interested to know that there was an article in the Southern Illinoisan about a week ago uh, profiling the, our discussion today. Uh, it calls Simon Institute to host culture change discussions. So I will send you that clip for your uh, for your scrapbook. And let's also talk. I mean, more broadly about um, you know what happened. I mean, you know, the internet you know came barreling through. And newspapers just were very, very late to figure out how to survive in that environment. You know, classified ads were always central to the existence of these papers. So what, um, I, I mean, I guess we, you know, books have been written about what happened to the, the newspaper industry, but, but, but where are we now? I mean, are there glimmers of hope? Is there some kind of stability that we've reached or is it just, you know, sadly a, a contraction that's gonna continue? A profoundly mixed bag. Um, I think the University of North Carolina determined that over 2,000 uh, American newspapers, you know, some of which had been publishing since the 19th century, just you know, closed their doors. I mean, that's that is a tragedy. Um, if I can pause here for a second and give a, a shout out to uh, the Daily Egyptian of the uh, of Southern Illinois University. I think when you and I were emailing, I mentioned that. On one of my trips through Carbondale, you know, I, I always try and get the college newspaper too. And this was several years ago, but I thought, man, this is a damn good college paper. Um, I, I, I know that these things fluctuate and, you know, a lot of it depends on the, you know, the chemistry of the editorial staff to come together to really do something nice. And sometimes in some years to go fallow. Um, but the time that I passed through Carbondale, um, one of those times, um, it was a real high water mark for the Egyptians. So. Excellent job. Um, but to uh, the atrophy of, of, of local newspapers. Yeah, I mean, reporters, as, as you remember, John, have every reason to detest the corporate management that they work for, um, you know, curse them frequently. Um, I think maybe the biggest curse of all of the newsroom towards the ownership um, is that, you know, you guys weren't even doing what we, you know, that, that should have justified your incredibly high salaries which is to, you know, have some sense of business foresight and to see that this kind of uh, model was going to go away and that we forgot um, in, the, in the old cliche that uh, just as um, horse and buggy manufacturers forgot that they were in the transportation business and failed to invent the railroad, um, we forgot that we were in the information business. Uh, there are several early examples of newspapers trying to computerize and realizing that um, users were far more interested in talking to each other than they were in responding to stories. And it's like, you know, the Dallas Morning News could have invented Facebook. <laughs> you know, had there been um, a, a really smart and appropriate way to uh, channel that um, incredible energy, that sociability that exists when you're behind the keyboard. Um, you know, newspapers could have done what Verizon did to cornering the data market. Um, instead, uh, they took a nap and now here we are. Yeah. Tom, you have a very powerful chapter on uh, what you call dirty towns. And, and you begin by saying, you know, that we have this, we've t tended to have sort of a veneration of the town, as you call it, the most benign form of government. Um, uh, supplying, you know, parks and, and recreational facilities and libraries and so forth. And you're right, you said the town is a national pastoral and a place of safety. The warmly lit cluster of fellowship set into the dark plain. It is a metaphor of life against death. But then in your chapter, you profile a number of towns um, that are sort of that are malevolent, I think you could say, your town governments. And, and you have a very, very powerful section on a whole slew of towns in St. Louis County. There's like 81 of them that effectively live on kind of preying on their citizens. I mean, talk about that phenomena. Sure. Um, we do have these warm and fuzzy associations around cities, and we're, we're inclined to um, view them charitably, um, but if you think about it, uh, the uh, and, and, and unless it's a you know an outright shooting war, the uh, government entity that is most likely to kill you um, is your town. 
um, most uh, most you know horrifically through police shootings. And uh, the St. Louis County, which is distinct from the city of St. Louis, it surrounds it like a crescent. Um, it consists of uh, since at, since the book was written, those municipalities have actually shrunk down to seventy something. Uh, still, it's it's this astonishing dice throw of these little towns, these little you know charter towns that sh probably should not exist. And uh, famously, um, they prey on their African American residents um, for uh, all kinds of little chicken crap, little things like you know traffic fines uh, for code violations. Um, folks get um, put in jail over the weekend because there's like a warrant out for them because they uh, had a, a, a taillight that needed repairing. I mean, just all, all kinds of incredibly petty uh, uses of the law. And uh, famously, after the Michael Brown um, shooting, the Department of Justice looked at the governance of Ferguson, Missouri, and said, you know, this wasn't just about uh, a, a dubious police shooting. Uh, this was about Ferguson nickel and diming its residents for years and the pent up frustration of, you know, these little BS traffic fines and small infractions. So um, I, I went there to, to report on a place called Calverton Park, which is just like four residential blocks and the city hall and the courthouse is in this ranch home. And you wonder, like, why is this even a city? Um, and I went there on Wednesday, which is court night. And of course, there's like this massive line of people out there um, trying to settle these little stupid tickets, you know, five miles over the limit. It's going to cost them hundreds of dollars, which is only perpetuating poverty. And the question is, well, how do we get here? And it occurred to me, um, if you want to know why like a town is really dysfunctional in terms of its government, you know, endemic corruption and so forth. And there's examples of this all over the country. Peer underneath the town's origin story. And I don't claim this to be a scientifically provable theory, um, but I operated with the idea that uh, towns that were established for reasons of segregation and racism, for reasons of tax evasion, um, for uh, reasons of uh, trying to set up a speed trap. You see a number of these towns in the South. Look at that and see if like there's kind of this, forgive this sort of metaphor, but this kind of evil spirit almost that continues to the present day. So it's a way of connecting the town's origin story to some of the ways that um, it's not a place that you can be proud of or want to live. And you talk about it, you know, a number of police officers just not, as you say, like being a collection agent for greedy cities. So they're part of this pernicious system where there's pressure on them to 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 generate revenue by writing these tickets to people who, um, you know, oftentimes are doing just the most minor of offenses and often like racially targeted uh, arrests too. Yes, um, and it's a mixed bag, obviously. You know, it's, it's hard to generalize what exactly the, the town cops think of all this. Um, certainly, you know, I've hit speed traps and gotten like little tickets for five over in a place where, you know, that never should have been posted at 35. And it's pretty obvious what's going on, it's mainly in the US South. Um, and it seemed like the officer to me, as he's, you know, gleefully writing my ticket, is taking some pleasure in this. You know, I'm sure that his, you know, job performance is part of the metrics there. Um, but I did find some officers in St. Louis, um, not on duty, but you know, retired, um, who told me how disgusted they were with what they were being asked to do. And that, you know, they, they didn't feel any special animosity towards the people that they were pulling over. But, you know, it's like one of these things that's, you know, I'm just following orders. Right. Well, one other thing that, that's delightful about your book is a, a chapter um, uh, called High Points in which you describe your, uh, your commitment or uh, passion about going to the highest point in every state. And the la at least at the writing of the book, you had been to 44 of them. Um, talk about this, uh, this, uh, this impetus you have to, to go to the high point. And also really, I mean, you write very beautifully and powerfully about, I mean, you know, some of the experiences when you do it. So talk about that. Yeah, thank you. Um, 
one one of the hardest uh, high points, and the, the, these range from you know places like Mount Elbert in Colorado to Kings Peak in uh, Utah, places that are um, you know fourteen thousand feet in those cases. Mount Whitney in California, seventeen thousand feet. One of the one of the harder high points actually to bag is in Illinois. Uh, it's a place called Charles Mound, um, which is uh, right up against the uh, Wisconsin border. And uh, it's on private land. And the, the family that uh, happens to own it, the Wubbles family, um, only opens it up uh, four weekends out of every year to cater to those eccentric people, uh, such as myself, who make it a, you know, sort of a, a mission to collect these these high points. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a gorgeous place, and you know Illinois is um, perhaps a good example of how this topographic accident of you know what what bump on on the land in, in, in the case of the Midwest, let's say, is is going to be you know higher than any other within the boundaries, the nineteenth century boundaries that were drawn often for you know vanished political reasons. Somehow, and I, I lack good words for this, that spot um, in that state is representative of the state as a whole. It's like a crystallization, uh, a distillation of it. And so standing on Charles Mound, where you can actually look into Wisconsin, um, on this uh, perfectly ordinary and pleasant um, corn and soybean farm, I don't know, just somehow there's something just sort of majestic about it. Um, it's Uber Illinois. And they can be really mundane, but there's beauty in that uh, banality. <laughs> and you say that you really make a, a point of, of as you're like ascending to, to think for a few minutes about the state and just, you know, what does this sort of represent? Yeah, I mean, we have sentimental associations with our state. And these are um, you know, legal boundaries, and in many cases, the, the particular laws and customs of that state really do make a difference in um, how people uh, live their lives in terms of uh, guns, abortion, alcohol, um, marriage licenses, all manner of like uh, kind of check marks of, of, of life that the state governs. You know, we have, as, as the constitutional scholars say, full faith and credit across these state boundaries. And so therefore, you know, it's kind of leveled, you know, these are almost like the, in some sense, the historic um, shires of, of, of England that, you know, don't really mean much anymore from a government way, like, you know, for example, Devon and Essex and Cornwall. Um, but we assign meaning to states, we assign characters to states. I think of the old Illinois license plate I don't know if uh, the state is still issuing these. You would tell you would you would be able to tell me where on the left I think it was was the Sears Tower and the depiction of the Chicago skyline, and on the right was a was a swooping mass of farmland down the bottom of the plate. You remember that? I do, and I I, I have not seen those that depiction in a long, long time. I mean, I'm, I'm from Illinois, and I do vaguely remember that, but uh, but now we're just sort of focusing on Lincoln. Yeah. Yeah, uh, obviously the State Department of Transportation sort of makes its redesigned decisions every few years, but you know, license plates are occasionally a good window into what the iconography of, of, of the state is. What, how does the state like to present itself? And uh, what, what about that place is, is unique? Um, you may be old enough uh, as, as I am to remember a game called Game of the States, right? Right. Yeah, it's like this little teaching tool from Fisher Price that's uh, appropriate for ages six through ten. And each one of these little puzzle pieces of a U.S. state like had a little, uh, little rebus items on them. You know, like uh, for Vermont, it was like a jug of maple syrup, right? You know, for Florida, it was an orange. Uh, yeah, we 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 think of these uh, distinctive economies, the the kind of uh, thing that uh, as as John Gunther would ask people. What makes this place special? Tom, you have a, a, a remarkable chapter in the book on um, watching your grandmother's house be torn down. Uh, your grandmother had lived there, this house, for 61 years. Uh, it was on the, I think, the eastern outskirts of Phoenix. 
the homes that the, these these older homes have been purchased and torn down and sort of McMansions built. Um, and, and tell us about that experience. I mean, it would be, um, you know, for many of us who maybe had a grandparent and we spent time there, you know, almost a kind of torture to see that house that we have such powerful association with torn down. Talk about that if you would. Sure. I mean, I, I think uh, many of us um, have had a similar uh, experience of, you know, um, newly marrieds move away. And um, when they have kids, the kids are brought to grandma and grandpa's house, which, you know, contains always a, uh, a kind of a sentimental aura about it. Um, a place that uh, is probably your first vacation, quote unquote, as a, as a child. And uh, in, in, in my case, you know, I got to uh, um, interact with my grandmother there up until, you know, I was, I think, 44 years old um, when she uh, she finally uh, went to her reward and uh, the house stood, you know, vacant and, you know, decrepit for a few more years until the family finally got around to selling it to um, some crass millionaires here in the town of Paradise Valley where we didn't belong. You know, my family's a lower middle class family and, um, you know, this, this, this land was always going to be worth far, far more than the hand-built Adobe house. And so you know, it's of course what they call a teardown. And there, there comes a moral dilemma. Is this something you want to watch? If you miss it, you'll never get to see it again. You know, it happens just once. And uh, I really went back and forth on this. Um, and finally, I decided, you know, I'm, I'm going to steal up and go. And it was extremely upsetting, you know, um, the crassness of it, um, the casualness of it. Houses, when they're destroyed, if you've ever seen one come down, they come down fast, you know. Um, and this is this is you know a place that people really really cared about. This was a hand built house, yeah. Um, and it's of course a reminder of mortality. It's a metaphor for the decay of the body, not just the bodies of people that you love, but your own. You know, you, we we all know that we're going to be quote unquote torn down someday. And um, it's it's a memento mori, as they say, and it's tough. Um, but I'm really glad that I did see it um, in the same breath. I'm really sorry that I saw it. Yeah. And you write powerfully, you say, and this is America too, a country of destruction and reinvention where the Sith sits on the table next to the blueprint. We think we own the land, but the land survives while we and our sand structures do not. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, it, it is humbling to think about geologic time, and we've become accustomed in the United States to think of um, the Constitution um, as uh, rock-bottomed and copper-sheathed, as uh, Stephen Benet Vincent put it. Um, but um, we also can see the fragility of our national experiment. Um, January 6th was uh, a, a shocking sight, I think, and should have been for everyone. Um, no matter what you think of um, the factors behind it, just the, uh, the sense that uh, we do live um, underneath the cover of law and essentially an anarchic universe. And will the United States, um, you know, survive or will it become, you know, one of these kind of... Uh, forgotten principalities, for example, in Germany, like Silesia or Prussia that exist in, in memory, um, but, you know, not in a governing reality. It's, it's humbling to think about. Well, in your book, you, you write about the divisions in the United States, and your book is not an overtly political one, but it talks about just this divide that has, has, has you know, imposed itself on the country. And you write, before the, the virus parted the waters and created physical separations, many Americans had already taken themselves into a spiritual and informational cocoon, disgusted with their neighbors and tired of the quest for common ground. Polls show roughly half the members of our opposing political parties have a level of extreme personal distrust for one another. Yeah, it, 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 it breaks your heart. And it's easy to get uh, nostalgic. It's easy to um, 
look at uh, the politicians of our childhood and think that they were, you know, more honorable, um, less clownish um, than they are today. And I try to keep that in mind that the, 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 the present always tends to look kind of bad and the past always looks pretty good to us. It's just sort of human nature. Um, by an objective measurement though, um, our, our political present is, um, is I think distinctively less happy than let's just use uh, the mid eighties as a, as a benchmark. Um, a, a book I really admired was uh, George Packer's The Unwinding. Um, which located some of our distress in um, the, um, what's the word, the pulling apart of incomes, personal incomes. Um, it's easy to blame the Reagan tax cuts. You know, we can also look to the, um, um, the shrinkage of unions. We can look to um, automation in the workplace that took away the really high paying industrial job. Um, we can look to uh, manipulative banking practices that uh, sort of took that power out of the hands of ordinary people. Um, and, um, you know, the, the, the urbanization of, of, of talent. I mean, that's, that's an old story going back to Theodore Dreiser, but uh, what effect does it have when, um, you know, the town gets kind of hollowed out of the people who would otherwise wanna, you know, uh, raise kids there and build something cool? Well, what um, I mean, one other feature of American life that you write about, which is surprising to me because, you know, there is the kind of the, the notion of, of sort of endless mobility. And you argue that that has has slowed even prior to COVID. And you had said you, you quoted a statistic that in the 1950s, you know, one in five Americans would would change their address in a given year. But now the number is one in nine. Why do you think that's the case? Why is that uh, that aspect of American life altered? Yeah, no, it's, that's a great question. And that's kind of, um, I think, the vague heart of what I was uh, get, trying to get at through the whole collection is that um, geography um, means more than it ever did to um, uh, folks who uh, work in certain kinds of uh, businesses. That is to say, agriculture, mining, healthcare, retail, you know, the physicality of that kind of work requires that you live there. Um, for uh, others, typically more economically privileged and mobile, geography matters less than it ever did. You can live anywhere. You can be a digital cowboy in, uh, in Jackson Hole. You know, you can take your, uh, you can take your, your business, uh, financial services business to Arlington, Vermont. Um, you you have a, a kind of a lightness um, and, a, and a lack of uh, commitment to physicality that is denied others who simply can't afford to move or cannot move because of the particular work that they're in. And um, this is this hits us paradoxically. It's it's the uh, the kind of uh, what's the word the curse and the blessing of American geography. Well, I know you're not running for political office or, or anything, but as you look at, at, at some of these trends you're talking about, you know, what do we do? I mean, at a personal level, at a community level, at a national level, what, wh where do we start to, to find more solid ground? Right. I mean, one, one trend that I, I find um, actually heartening is the rise of uh, nonprofit digital media. That is to say, uh, watchdog publications like the Colorado Sun, uh, the Arizona Mirror, the Vermont Digger, um, these um, newspaper, I'm going to say substitutes, even though that's not completely correct. But, you know, the idea of uh, uh, nonpartisan journalism that keeps watch on what's going on in the state, that uh, does foster a sense of uh, accountability and togetherness. I think it's really hopeful when um, dying newspapers adopt a, um, uh, a nonprofit model like, for example, the Pointer Institute. Um, the Salt Lake Tribune where I used to work is now a, a nonprofit uh, entity. And thank God, because they got bought by one of the worst hedge, hedge funds around. Um, something else um, that has been accelerated by technology um, is the extreme gerrymandering. 
that happens in uh, congressional districts. So I'm, you know, far from the the first person to to point this out, but map making software has, you know, uh, allowed uh, districts to be, cre be created that you know use like these little tweezers to go into you know block by block almost and pick out all the Republicans or Democrats and herd them all into uh, one ridiculously shaped district like you know Jim Jordan's in Ohio that you know virtually guarantees that whoever runs in that um, primary is going to have no interest in pitching a message that um, is a broad appeal. They're going to try and be the angriest person. Uh, in the primary and therefore win election to Congress. States are natural gerrymanders, so there's no getting around that. But uh, I'm a big fan of uh, independent redistricting commissions. Not perfect, but um, certainly better than um, letting the majority in the state legislature handle it. Well, having seen so much of this country, um, are you hopeful? I mean, what, uh, what, where are we now? I mean, how do, how does, how does, um, what is the tipping point and in, in which way do, do things move? I do take a lot of heart, uh, John, when, um, and like I said, I really haven't been traveling for two years and I miss it dearly. Um, but to, to go to a uh, small town USA and typically for me in the Midwest, which is where I find, um, sort of the, the, the greatest sense of, um, intrigue, mystery, beauty, um, to talk to folks uh, in those towns, you know, I'm just, you know, Joe Schmo off the road, um, you know, at the, at the next diner stall with a cup of, uh, cup of coffee. Um, but asking them, you know, hey, what's, what's, what's going on in this town? And, you know, hearing, you know, some of the commonsensical solutions that still happen in the sense of, cooperation, um, the sense of uh, togetherness. Um, a really wonderful book that um, I'd like to plug is called Our Towns by uh, James and Deborah Fallows, who uh, operated from many theses, but you know, among them that you know, don't, don't write off uh, local uh, innovation. And you know, don't forget that there are uh, lots of capable people out there um, in um, outside the national power centers who um, haven't drunk the crazy, or even if they have on certain national levels, you know, are not really, you know, taking that into the city council meeting. Right. I might just say the, the Institute is working with uh, the former governor of Illinois, Jim Edgar. We have a statesmanship award that looks at just this question of, you know, is there statesmanship occurring at state and local government, you know, away from the national political scene? You know, people doing, you know, mayors, city council members, folks doing constructive, hard things for the betterment of their communities, you know, regardless of whether people are watching or not. Yeah, when, when, when Trump was sworn in as president in um, January 2017, um, it was, uh, for me, a, just a terribly depressing time for all kinds of reasons. But I happened to have been living in a small town in West Texas uh, at that time. And um, one night, uh, for some reason, um, I can't remember why, I went down to the city council meeting and uh, happened to meet the mayor. And he was enthusiastically telling me about you know, this plan that he was trying to do through Austin, the capital, to get a uh, some sort of prohibition lifted on the, the, the town's little local airport, you know, which was essentially just a windsock and a dirt strip. And uh, regardless of, you know, again, the, the, the national insanity, like the, the, the business was still going on. People were still trying to be pragmatic and, you know, um, smart and conciliatory uh, about things that actually made their communities a better place. And, you know, I think that spirit is alive and well. Well, tell us a little bit about the Los Angeles Review of Books. I know you've celebrated, I think, your 10th anniversary, and it's you're trying to, as I understand it, rekindle. I mean, you know, the book reviews are declining. You know, book sections of, of newspapers have, have fallen uh, by the wayside. But you're, one part of your mission, I think, is to just kind of can try to keep a, an interest alive in, in books and, and, and literature. Talk about what you guys are working on. Sure. Um, 10 years ago, as you say, uh, it was founded as a, uh, an alternative to the New York Review of Books, which 
um, has a uh, some high walls around it. You know, they really don't like uh, taking on new writers. Um, they're very particular about the kinds of pieces that they write and the books that they review. We viewed ourselves as a, more of a freewheeling democratic uh, experiment where we would uh, give assignments to um, often uh, extremely uh, inexperienced writers, um, you know, insisting on quality, of course, um, but nevertheless, like wanting to broaden uh, the conversation, um, make make it bigger, um, uh, reinforce the idea that uh, reading is a, uh, a, a democratic pastime, um, that it uh, enlarges the spirit, um, that it uh, should be open to just about um, everyone. And so uh, I, I do love um, uh, working with people who have never written a book review before. Um, I didn't think I could do it. Um, I was always sort of, you know, uh, mystified by people who were so good at writing book reviews. I thought, eh, yeah, that takes a special talent that I just don't have. And, you know, that was so self-limiting. That's not true. Um, and uh, we love kind of uh, reviewing books that otherwise wouldn't get attention, you know. Um, the, the New York Times can, uh, can review the big political tomes by um, Bob Woodward, you know. We're going to take a look at what a political scientist from, you know, the University of Houston has to say. And uh, we're going to assign that book um, to um, a 22-year-old writer who grew up in Boyle Heights, Los Angeles. Well, tell us about your teaching. I know you have affiliations both at Dartmouth and, Ch and Chapman. Tell us about uh, and your, your work with students and, and what, uh, what, what you like about it. Yeah, um, I'm sort of a mid-career academic. I didn't walk into a, a college classroom until I was 43 years old. Um, and it is, it is, as you know, just John, just a consistent uh, uh, delight. Uh, I really don't worry for the, uh, the, the, the future of the country uh, when it comes to um, the, uh, what's commonly called the snowflakery of today's youth. I just really don't say that, you know. Um, certainly, I don't agree with everything that's said in the classroom, but uh, there's still a, a respect for um, uh, polite exchange. Um, most of the sort of fireworks that we hear about on College campuses are the, um, you know, the, the the stuff that makes the papers, and often the result of um, professional provocateurs. What gets missed are the uh, ten thousand conversations that are happening right now that are perfectly reasonable and productive. Well, let me ask you finally: Is there what what is your next book? I'm sure there is something coming, but what what is the next big idea for you? Oh, thank you. Um, it's a piece of regionalism. It's about my home state of Arizona. It's uh, 17 linked essays that uh, try to get to the heart of this Sunbelt state and uh, what makes it uh, tick. So uh, some of it is quite critical. Uh, some of it is a celebration. University of Arizona Press, uh, spring 2023. Perfect. Well, we will definitely be looking for that. And Tom, when COVID allows, we would, I know you've been to Carbondale, was it two times or several times at least? Several uh, times. Yeah. So we would like to, to get you here either driving or I know you also love trains. Um, so we can maybe put you on the Saluki Express and get you from Chicago to Carbondale. Oh, or, I love it. I love it. Absolutely. That would be perfect. Well, thank you so much, Tom. It's really been a delightful conversation. And I would encourage folks to read this book, The National Road. It really is a great read, very insightful, and some really uh, profound insights into aspects of American life. Uh, John, thank you. These are uh, tremendous questions. I really appreciate it. Thank you. And thanks to all of you for watching another edition of our series. Uh, we will have this video on our YouTube channel uh, tomorrow. Please look at it, show it to family and friends. And thank you for supporting the Institute and keeping the memory of Paul Simon alive and well. Thank you so much.